Yes, indeed. I'm going to talk about mobility. That's, that's my specialism. And, uh, and I'm also going to make the future a little bit and talking about making the future. I liked the title of this conference because it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've been working at TNO, I've been working at TomTom Tom and the university. It's all innovative companies. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to make the future. Uh, now, in mobility, making the future also means that you have to predict the future a little bit. I'm going to explain that later on. And predicting the future is very difficult. Making the future is much easier and much more fun. Prediction of, of the future is also getting more difficult, and also will explain that. So, in order to cover myself, I want to start with some historical predictions, as you're already seeing. Uh, because that, that's, that's, this is about 110 years ago, how people thought that the world would look like in the year 2000. This is a Dutch of a German uh, chocolate brand, and they put on their chocolate bar some pictures of the future. It's a, light, it's a big series, you can look it on the internet. This is one, of course, we would be able to fly in 100 years, that's what everybody thinks all through history. Um, but they also had some good ideas about uh, uh, cities that were weatherproof, just like this. The Queen of England could use that uh, two, days, two days ago, I guess, on her birthday. Oh, England could use it, by the way. Uh, but there's also one thing very since when, when they had some leisure time, they, they have foreseen that during your leisure time you would go to the park and not sit at the water, but uh, go underwater and talk to each other. For some kind of reason, they, that, that looked fun. So, just to indicate that uh, predicting the future is a little bit difficult. Uh, but of course, this is a PR campaign of a chocolate brand from Germany. Uh, we have also some, t some scientists I look up. This mister is from the RAND Corporation. That's, that's uh, an important organization, still existing in the United States. They advise the government for what the future is all about. And they asked these people how this home computer of the future would look like. They asked this in 1954. This is just about 10 years after this famous quote from the IBM president, uh, Thomas Watson, as we're called. And he said that the total market for home computers in the future would not exceed five. <laughs> now, a lot of people laugh about that quote still today, but actually he was perhaps closest of uh, everybody on the earth it's with, with this five. Nobody said any more. So uh, after 10 years, they decided we want to know how this looks like. This is what they came up with. And you have to give the guys some credit, because it, we, we're talking 2004 that they had to make the prediction of, and um, you see that uh, as the screen, uh, in 2004 we didn't all have flat screens, so that, that's quite close. The printers, we still had some printers that look like this, also the keyboard is close, only the size is a little bit different, and when you look at the mouse that's just beside him, that's totally wrong. But, <laughs> but, but maybe even more important, if, if you would have guessed 10 years later, would you have guessed that computers would, like, like, would, uh, would be flat cigarette boxes, like the iPhone now? That's probably very far off, because it seems that in the last couple of years, this technology is really exponentially growing. And that's actually truth, uh, just to show some picture on that. By the way, if you like what I'm going to tell in the next minute, then Ray, uh, read Ray Kurzweil's books. You see the source uh, down there. It's, it's amazing, interesting what's happening with all this, uh, this technology and the expo exponential growth with it. If you're not interested in this, then also read his books, you will get interested. <laughs> because it says, this is Moore's law, and the Moore's law says that every year, the capacity of computers will more or less double. And if you see, all through history, this is the last 110 years, this has been a fact independent of the technology used. You see, it starts with uh, punch cards, and it goes via vacuum tubes to transistors to now the integrated circuits. It grows every year twice. And I have to say proudly that the last years, of course, this is also driven by a brain pot company, ASML. We should be very proud of them. Uh, I am, at least. Uh, the fact is this, is, this is actually the reason why such a birthday card, if you have this birthday card with a, with, with a song in it, when you open it, it's very, uh, and the battery lasts very long. People with children know that. It's very annoying. <laughs> and so, um, but the, the memory of the capacity uh, of the calculation of this card is comparable to the Apollo 11 that brought a man to the moon. 
and back. That's even better. So <laughs> it's, it's really comparable capacity. Because a computer of $1,000 every year, it can do twice as much. It's also the reason that nowadays a kid with a smartphone in Africa has access to more information than the President of the United States had 15 years ago. And it's also why we can't live with the internet anymore, because all these developments on the internet and these, these, these services that come on the internet is are driven by this, this kind of technology. We can't live with internet, and it's only widely introduced 10, 15 years ago. Some people can't live with smartphones. They're only here for three, four years. And in four years, we can't imagine that we, in 2012, we lived without a certain service or device that we don't know the existence of today. It's all going to happen. Because the future is also in this area. If you, if you just extend this, and why shouldn't you? It's, it, was, it has been like this 110 years ago, so it will probably also continue this development. Then you will see that around 2020, a little bit later, we have a $1,000 computer that has just the capacity of a brain. And that's interesting because then shortly after that, probably we start re-engineering the brain, and again, another couple of years, we might be able to make a backup copy of our brain that also reacts just as we should react and that also will be there when we are not there anymore. That's also an interesting thing. It gets scary. And it's also one of the reasons this technology breakthrough that all our life expectation goes up very fast. So during this one-day conference here, the life expectations of human mankind will raise about seven hours, only today. Some people say that the first human being that will be 1,000 years old is already born. So that's interesting times. But let's get back to the ground here. Prediction of the future is very difficult, that's a fact. What should you do then, as a company or as a person? Make sure you're open for innovation, be fast, and be agile. Make sure that you can quickly turn around in order to follow a new direction, because you can't predict what this direction exactly is. Make sure you're quickly, because then you will be able to join the force that is making the future, instead of that the future is, uh, will overcome you. Now, as I said, I work in innovative companies. I'm lucky that for two days per week, I also work here at the uh, university, where we work on smart mobility, as we call it. It's one of the three key research areas in the university. And it's where we combine all the knowledge that we have on transport and logistics, and automotive technology, and electronics, and software, all these things that are important for mobility, in order to actually safeguard this freedom and prosperity and fun that mobility brought us, and uh, just use this technology to fight the negative consequences of mobility. Because that's how mobility should look like. This is how it looks. A lot of congestion, a lot of pollution. We're working on engines and new fuels that, in combination, might deliver engines that come up with emissions that are a lower level than the surrounding air that we are uh, taking in. So we're actually vacuum cleaning the air. And that's here in the lab facility already almost achieved. And this is the smartest region, not the dirtiest region. So it's not because of the outside air is so dirty. And also working on sustainable fuels, electrical drive systems. It's very interesting. Come join us if you can. Also making traffic safer is very important. Still, it, it, it goes down, the, the safety goes up rapidly in the last couple of years, mainly due to uh, vehicle technology. But there's new steps to make. I can foresee that in the future somewhere it will be very hard to make an accident with a car. The essence of this car is that it's uh, actually in line with Moore's law. Uh, cars get cleverer, twice as clever every year, because they also use these electronics, and a little bit later than the, than the consumer devices, but then also the automotive follows, and they get cleverer and cleverer, and they know everything. They know what kind of weather it is, they know the mood of the driver, they can also distract that from its movements. They know where the car is, they know where the car is heading, they know how slippery the, uh, the surface is. They also know if you're going to make this curve or not, and it can also take action. The car is so smart, so smart, it can probably drive the car better than the driver. Of course, not you, but other drivers. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the question is how would this, this clever cars, this, this fantastic technology, be able to also fight congestion? Because we hate congestion, and everybody hates congestion. You hate congestion. But congestion is not caused by you, it's caused by all the other cars that are in your way. There's other cars that drive stupid, these cars stink, there are people that give you the finger, they cut you off, they tailgate you, it's, it's terrible. They're horrible people, all the other drivers. 
and they don't take public transport. That's also uh, that's also a mistake of the other people. <laughs> so, th yeah, these these other people are all horrible people. You hate them, um, but but at the same time, as soon as you are uh, a few hours later, you're you. These are the same people that keep the door open to you, and uh, you have a nice chat with when you're in the elevator, and when they turn out to be in the same football team, they're going to be your best friends maybe. So. As soon, because unlike in a car, then people will be connected. And as soon as people are connected, they start to be actually nicer to each other. And you actually see this on the mobility area. For this, if, if, you, get, if you get a warning from a, from a car at the other side of the street that, that there's a speed bump, then it's you and the other drivers connected against the police and warning each other for speed traps. That's a typical thing. And somehow this community of motorcyclists also waves to each other because they feel connected somehow as well. Now, the next step, really what's happening now, and, and, and already heard it be before, it's, it's the internet, uh, the internet of things now also achieving mobility because these very smart cars now start talking to each other. And these cars, with all their wisdom, now can also warn other cars what's happening in front and they can also automatically keep distance. And this is yet another thing, an improvement and making mobility more safe, making the future of mobility also more clean and, and, and much more comfortable. Now at TomTom, Tom, this is exactly what we invested in. Connecting different drivers with each other. Doing so, you can also make your own future. Because the future, when, you're, when your future on the road is just a couple of miles ahead of you. And there are people a couple of miles ahead of you experiencing your future. And maybe they have information that I can use. You know, things what you want to do is try to connect these people with each other, or at least the information that they have, and they will be able to also change their future if necessary. Now, the, the idea as such is actually simple. Um, we have TomTom -tom systems with uh, small SIM cards in it, so they just call every now and then with our back office, every one, two, three minutes. And yeah. When they call, then we get 60, 120, or 180 positions in because they know where they are, and we just it is all anonymous because it's already anonymized before it enters our building, and this is very strictly checked and audited, and that's very important as well because you don't want to trace anything of this information back to an individual. We don't want to do that, um, and then in a split second we can also use this information also to send it back to people as traffic information. Uh, it's all in the numbers. This is this. This, at this moment, what TomTom Tom gets in at data, so it's five billion positions and speed informations of all our millions of customers driving around in order for us to say where the traffic is stuck in blocking and where the congestion is, because we hate congestion just as you do. It's, uh, our mission is to get people from A to B in a fastest way, in a most comfortable way, in a safest way, and this congestion really gets in our way, literally and figur figuratively speaking. So, if you then make traffic information that, you can feed this back to the people and they can drive the better route for that. They see their future in front of them, helped by other people that we connect them to. Now, this is just a very worst case day. This is the 3rd of February, you might remember, this Friday with a lot of snow in the Netherlands, and this is well, what kind of traffic jams that we saw only in a small piece of Amsterdam only. Uh, and everywhere where there are cars, we see if there's a traffic jam. That's the, that's the, the specialism of this, this system. Now, it's also a system that works without borders, so this is what we see in London. And this is actually an average day in London, because they're, also jam they're always jammed. Now, we, this, this is actually what's happening here, and we, we heard it before, is actually the information um, economy uh, now also entering the mobility area. So cars talking to each other, and people already knowing what's happening. Uh, it's actually, traffic management will be more and more a self-steering system of well-informed individuals. That's how the internet works as well. Self-steering by well-informed individuals. Now, road authorities get very nervous from that. Already 20 years ago, when Philips here in Eindhoven started with car navigation, they saw it coming. They say, okay, that, that's maybe not good because if people have an individual advice to go left and we, with our big signage, hope that they would go right, then 95% of these people will go left because that's an individual advice, and in fact it is. 
individual advice are being followed up much higher. This 5% that do not follow up the individual advice of a navigation system also don't listen to the public signing. They just go straight ahead because they know better. <laughs> but okay, that's, that's, that was it. So they thought, road authority thought, okay, here, here, this is the end of uh, traffic management. This will be a big chaos. But science of, of uh, independent research already has shown that the use of navigation system, for instance, already le leads to 10, 15% less miles and less fuel consumed because people are much more relaxed when they know what their arrival time is and, and, and much other effects. So we, we already save fuel, we save time, but we mainly also save uh, accidents because it's much safer driving with navigation systems around. And they didn't know. So we are helping the government with their mission. That's only the first thing. Now, the second phase that we're doing is because of this information that people know where the congestion are, they start, because of the quality of the information, they start adapting their behavior. Uh, and they might take another route. And you only have to get 1% out, out of a traffic jam, and it will go down with 5 to 10%. So that, that's a very strengthening effect, and they will also solve the problem. And last but not least, if, if people see that this information is correct, it's a very good marriage, this information, with the fact that people also have more flexibility in their working hours, and they might decide to work an extra hour at home. These are all effects that are now increasingly, we already see this in the figures, traffic jams are going down, not only because we're building new roads, it's mainly because people are more flexible and have the better information to adapt their behavior. Now the last, what we're doing with the government is work together with them. Look at this data. The government of uh, London is, is very interested in, in also sharing this data with us and, 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 and working together with us to get this data. And we have another asset. We have eyeball attention in the car. In-car systems. And not only us, all in-car systems have eyeball attention. People follow up the, the advices. So that are, that's another thing, how we, in a public-private partnership, can help the government. And it will change mobility for the better. So. Summarizing what mobility will be like in the future, it will be clean, it will be maybe fossil fuel independent, I'm quite sure, it will be very safe, and being in a traffic jam will be a voluntary and a planable event. <laughs> That's already happening now, really. Now I also work in Amsterdam, so it's not because I'm here from the south of the Netherlands that I do not know what a traffic jam is. So, uh, that, so, th so that, that's, that's a fact. Now, uh, maybe also, it's it, because we use this by just connecting people. We get the power of the community, it's Wikinomics, but then in mobility. Power of the community and use it for their benefits and also for our benefit, and we create value for everyone. That's a cool thing. So maybe if people see that all these other drivers are not their enemy, they're not the ones that spoil the party, that's not the one that get in the way, but it's the one that contributes to your solution, that, that enable you to make your future, then people might also be a little bit nicer to each other. At least that's my hope in the new future. And just to finish off with a story, when I go uh, on vacation, I always ask my children to wave at every tom-tom that we pass. It's, yeah, it's because they paid for their holiday and uh, they should know that. <laughs> this, yeah, this, is, this is actually true, by the way. <laughs> my, my wife gets a bit annoyed by that and we also get some strange faces back. But these people might very well thank me, actually, because I'm driving ahead of them and for the next maybe for a few minutes, maybe even hour, my data is helping them to make them, their future a little bit better. Thank you very much.